Listeners, just a heads up, this interview was recorded before the start of the strike. Being a woman is expensive. And look, I know we're worth it, but when you consider that for each dollar a white man makes, on average, white women get 83 cents, black women 64 cents, and Hispanic women 57 cents, the additional costs associated with being a woman, they add up fast, which is why I have some serious choice words for what is known as the pink tax. The pink tax refers to the additional cost associated with products that are exclusively targeted toward women from like tampons and pads to deodorant and shampoo, vitamins, pink pens, pink razors, really anything that is pink. An extra dollar? Just an extra dollar here or there for products that are identical in purpose and design as those marketed to men, except they are pink or they have the word woman attached to them. The federal government has never passed any laws that forbid pricing discrimination based on gender because, you know, I mean, of course, some states are getting rid of the pink tax, like California, which passed they passed a law like that back in, way back in, just earlier this year. And look, I'm not even really saying that tampons need to be free. Okay, well, yes, okay, I actually am saying that. But I'm also just saying that women shouldn't be penalized for daring to need them. Because in the same way that men need Titleist hats, women need feminine products. It's not a luxury item. It's a health product. Do you want us to just free flow all over the subway? Do not answer that. Look, obviously we should absolutely close the gender pay gap. I can't believe I need to say that, but until that happens, and as women continue to be paid less than men, we also shouldn't have to spend more of those unequal earnings on items that have become gendered solely because of consumerism and capitalism. I promise there are plenty of ways of making us feel inferior. It's just going to take a little creativity. This is Choice Words. I'm Samantha B, and my guest today has become somewhat of a pink expert and caused an actual shortage of pink paint, which makes me wonder if pink paint is taxed higher than blue paint. I digress. On this episode, I talked to the incredible actor, writer, and director Greta Gerwig. Oh my god, I love a woman who can do it all. She's been nominated for numerous Oscar and Golden Globe Awards for films like Lady Bird and Little Women. And this summer, she's giving us the highly anticipated film, Barbie. So take a listen and make good choices. Oh my God, I'm so excited to be talking to you right now. You too. I'm oh. this is really exciting. I wish we were in the same uh, space, but I do too. I'm your, this is a really big deal. I'm just a huge fan. I, I'm, like, I'm so excited to talk to you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So this show, it's all about like choices, choices that you've made in your life. And I definitely want to talk about like big choices and big swings. But first, mm -hmm. I kind of want to know before we get started. When I say the word choice, it kind of means something different to everyone. Are you are you good at making choices? I don't like the feeling that I'm sort of uh, choosing something to the exclusion of other things. And I think mm. uh, um, I have a tendency to try to let the choice reveal itself. That's a oh. big thing that for me, because I feel like... Um, yeah, I, can, I And sometimes when I get panicked of, around like, do I do this? Do I do that? I'm right. like... I, I need to kind of step back from it. And I'm like, you know, which do like, you just have to get quiet enough to, mm. but, but when I'm in that thing of like, if I do this and I'm not doing that, I don't know. Um, it, it feels like a kind of, um, an amputation of a possibility in a way. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I like to feel like as if I'm not choosing so much as um just walking along the path that I'm meant to which is probably right. um it's probably just an avoidance of responsibility <laughs> in some sort of big way <laughs> I feel like I understand that it's like letting the letting the choice 
like rise in your body yes. in a way, like letting it rise um, in your body. Yes. You know, there's, um, I'm going to b- mangle this, but I am um, interested in, I like Quakers. I am not, a <gasps> Quaker, but do you know this concept? Yes. Yes. I love Quakers. I, I love know. the idea of Quakerdom. Yes. Um, there's a Quaker theologian, I guess that's what the, sort of the term, even though they don't have anything specific that you, you sort of have to mm-hmm. believe in. They don't have a creed the way other uh, Christian sects have creeds, but they, um, I think his name is Parker. I'll find his name. But um, uh-huh. he wrote really beautifully about um, this idea in Quaker tradition is you you get quiet with yourself. That's the whole mm-hmm. thing. And then you kind of like listen and maybe maybe God says something, maybe not. Um, but with choosing, they have a phrase. It says, way will open to you. Oh. That you're looking for way to open. And way can also close behind you. Mm-hmm. And you can feel way close behind you or way open in front of you. And I think that's actually stuck with me as an idea uh, that I thought was really beautiful. Like you can just know and um yeah mm-hmm. anyway I, I i i my apologies to any of your listeners who are quaker <laughs> and really know the quaker traditions i'm um i'm a sort of a a, a fan and a bystander but yeah I, I, I've, I've um i remember being very taken with that idea i'm sure that i've offended all quakers by being like i love quakers <laughs> in the most <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love a Quaker. But, <laughs> but I do love those like empty rooms where everybody just sits quietly and they only speak if they have something to say. I know. And I really, I know. I appreciate that deeply. Me too. <laughs> I've, I, I actually, um, I've, I've gone to a, a few Quaker meetings in my day. Um, and I think it's a very beautiful tradition. Mm-hmm. I feel like I like showbiz too much for it. Like I've always <laughs> like that, that. I mean, it's sort of the theatricality of the Catholic Church has always been like, but the hats, sure. like look at all those hats. <laughs> like this is so fun. And I was like, the Quaker thing feels like the thing I want to aspire to. But um, right. I like, I like the hats of the Catholics. I like the songs of the Protestants. I like the sort of austereness of the Quakers. Yes, the austerity is like very moving, but I do. I'm a, I, I'm a little bit with you. I'm like, the, but where does the Pope get his red shoes? They're, each pair is custom made. It's so, and there's so much blood. I know. It's like one step away from the Broadway stage. <laughs> I need a little razzle dazzle. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> do you? Well, okay. Let me ask you this then. So then when you're directing, you literally oh, yes. are forced to make choices on a split second, yeah, you know. are forced into that position where you're just constantly like rebuffing. You're, you're finding things that work in the moment. Mm-hmm. Was that comfortable for you right away? Or did you have to kind of figure out how to decision make so quickly? Um, yes. Well, I think, again, if you think about it as um, having to make a million decisions a day, which is what it is. But if you think about it that way, it can be quite paralyzing. But okay. if you think about... Um, Again, this all sounds really mystical, um, but I, I, I kind of believe movies want to be something like that they want, the, and, okay. and you sort of like listen to the movie. What does the movie want to be like with your collaborators and everything? It's like you're all kind of listening to the movie and trying to figure out what what, what it's saying to you. And it, I almost experience as a director when you're sort of in the the zone, it's like <laughs> this sounds like so silly, but like you know. <laughs> Um, did you ever see that movie, um, The Edge of Tomorrow? With, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Great. Yep. Great action yep. movie. I love I love it. Love it. That's such a, it's so great. So good. And um, So good. You know, they, um, so Tom Cruise, like, tries to get through this battlefield that's impossible. But, like, once he's, he figures it out over time and it's like a ballet. It's like everything, mm-hmm. it's like, this guy's going to come here and this person's over here and I'm going to know. And then this thing, it's, um... When I'm sort of in the zone with directing, I feel like, I feel like Tom Cruise. You have Tom Cruise. <laughs> Fighting the yeah. alien invaders all the way through because I'm just like, and this is coming here. And it's almost like I know the dance. And it's sometimes 
the moments that are scary is when you feel like you get out of sync with the dance and you think, oh right. no. And then you become aware of like, well, what's the next move? And you're like, find the dance again, find the dance again. And it takes a lot of trial and error to find the dance. Um, but uh, when you're in it, it's like the, it, it's a, it's a pretty addicting feeling the choreography like of, of just like uh, like uh, it's like you know someone comes up and they're like is it a is it a blue hat or a green hat green i'm certain of it let's go this way you know like it just <laughs> it feels like a like you just right. know the answer and it's um it, it, it's it, yes it's very wonderful so you're like always moving toward you keep the the, the thrust of the movie you're always moving in no. the direction of the thrust <laughs> that you're Yes, exactly. Actually, well, like Ryan said to me, because this, Ryan Gosling said to me, um, we were doing something just bananas, as many mm -hmm. of the things we do in this movie is bananas, are bananas. And he came up to me afterwards and he said, you really hear the song in your heart clearly. And I was like, <laughs> I do. You're right. I do. Like, I don't always feel that way. But like, right now with this one, I do. I I hear the song in my heart clearly. And but then like at the end of the day, when you're like driving home, sometimes you do have like, what did I do? Like, because you sure, because then you're like, I made all these choices. I want to undo them. <laughs> um, can we go back and just redo everything? Oh, that's yeah. such a compliment that you have the song in your heart. I know. I, I know. That was like one of the best things. Compliments. Mm -hmm. I'm repeating a compliment said to me by no. someone else. <laughs> Honestly, I would get it embroidered on a pillow. Yes, that's pretty nice. That's pretty nice. So what do you, I have to ask you, what is a choice that you feel like, even if it was a small choice mm -hmm. that you made, even when you were younger, I don't know, what is something that you think reverberated in your life and really made a difference in your life? Well, I, um, the thing I go to right away that is not a small choice, it's a big choice, mm -hmm. but, um, and, and, and the choice was more, again, a collection of accidents that like then became a choice um mm -hmm. but um going to barnard college was a that was m one of the biggest like uh if that kind of set up a, a bunch of other things um mm -hmm. from there but the the reason i went to barnard college was also i mean i i i went to new york city um uh, when i was in high school because i wanted to go i wanted to be in the musical theater program at nyu which okay um, I did not get into, but I did audition for it. And I auditioned for Juilliard, which I also did not get in. Um, <laughs> and my dad was like, well, we're here. Why don't we go look at Columbia? And I was like, I don't want to look at Columbia, but okay. Mm -hmm. And we took the train up and we walked around Columbia and he was like, and why don't we go look at Barnard? And actually I just like stepped on the campus and I just thought, oh, I want to be all of these women. Like it was almost like this instant <sighs> feeling of like, I love these women they're great and then this very strange thing happened where there was like a cancellation for an interview and they these interviews in-person interviews book up really early yeah and it was an interview with a woman who um had gone to barnard and was working in the um admissions department and she had been an opera singer and a math major and i was oh. like you're the coolest person i've ever met an opera singer and a math major yeah no, okay was like, all right and it was just like what who are all these interesting gals and um so and it was like too late to apply um er, early decision because i mm -hmm. didn't know about the school really and then um but i i wrote on my application like if i don't get into barnard college uh just uh keep this application because i'll apply as a transfer and then i got in and i and i and I got a scholarship and I, and I went and it was life-changing. I mean, that was like life-changing completely. Like I, you know, it, I can't, I, I don't think I would write if I hadn't done that. Did you feel like it was like coming home? Like you felt so you were like, Oh, this is my, this is my place. These are my people. I'm so lucky. Yeah. I found it young. Yes, I did. And I also felt like the, the professors I met there, the teachers I met, the, the students, it was like, um, all of these things had a place like I, mm -hmm. I didn't really, I, I was writing and when I was younger and when I was in high school, but I didn't really even know that I, you could, you could be, I don't know. Writing was sort of like, I just always assumed uh, someone much smarter than me was doing, was like, I wanted to be a playwright. And, but I, I was like, oh, I can't do that. And it was, 
you know, the people I met there that kind of said, well, yes, you can. You just have to work at it and mm -hmm. try. And I it's like, there were, but the, there was some, it was like things that seemed impossible to me, suddenly right. more possible. Don't you think it's so interesting? Like when you have a whole, you've set up a whole story in your own head mm -hmm. and then somebody literally needs to say to you, and it can't be your parents. It has to be someone in the outside world who says, well, why wouldn't it be you? Like, why not you? Yeah, I know. And it's really simple. And somebody just needs to like, it's almost like a breaking a spell. Right. You're in a some spell that you weren't even aware of. And then they kind of tilt you the other way. And you're like, what? Oh, huh? <laughs> oh right, right. Yes. Other people do it too. Like, it's like a job you can yes. do. Yes. But I guess I feel like in a way, like that, that was a choice. But I guess sometimes when I think of choice, I think of like, shall I do this or shall I do that? Right. And I guess for me, it's like, I chose it, but I really, it chose you too. Uh, yes. We you, chose each other. You chose each yeah. other, you know, way, way opened in front of me. <laughs> way opened, way opened. <laughs> way opened. Want to listen to the rest of this episode? Head over to your favorite podcast player to hear the entire show. I highly recommend it.